We've just heard about the composition of the treatise on the astrolabe. Now I'm going to talk about a manuscript some scholars have called the long-lost fourth part of Schulte's astrolabe. Um, and just to refresh your memory as to uh, what uh, Annie mentioned at the beginning of her talk, uh, this is the plan Chaucer laid out in his prologue. The first part, he tells us, will describe the astrolabe, uh, and the second part tells us 46 ways of using it. Uh, we've got those two parts in the extant treatise. The third part, he planned, would collate diverse astronomical tables, coordinates of stars, solar declination, and so on, like the tables produced by the friars John Summer and Nicholas of Lim. And the fourth part would be what he calls a theorica on the motions of the celestial bodies. The fifth and final part was to cover the theory of astrology. Now, fast forward to 1951, uh, and Derek Price is researching the history of astron astronomical instruments, and he comes on a volume in the library of Peterhouse in Cambridge. He found it was written in Middle English, datable to 1393, and as he put it, contained so many of the ingredients of the missing parts of the astrolabe. So he jumped to the obvious conclusion, changed his PhD topic to focus on this manuscript, but soon realised it didn't quite match what Chaucer had planned. Sorry if I'm in the way there. That didn't deter him too much, though. He concluded that Chaucer must have changed his plans. <laughs> Not unlikely. Uh, so this is the manuscript that Price found. It didn't have a title. Price gave it that one. And it contains a description of how to make a planetary instrument. It's beautifully illustrated. Uh, and the bulk of the manuscript is made up of diverse astronomical tables. And this one here is actually solar declination. And as you can see, the facing page cites John Summer. There it is a little bit larger. Uh, so you'll note, by the way, uh, that the tables and the notes surrounding them are mostly in Latin. Uh, and one more thing to note here, that this website address links to the Cambridge Digital Library, uh, where this manuscript has recently been digitized. Uh, so you can see all these images and play with a virtual model of the Equatorium. So, anyway, Price wasn't completely clutching at straws when he suggested this manuscript had something in common with the missing sections of the astrolabe. And it also wasn't that implausible to suggest, as Price did, that Chaucer had gone looking for a treatise on planetary theory to adapt, had found a treatise on an equatorium, and had decided that would work better. There was actually quite a common genre of treatise that taught planetary theory by describing instruments. Instruments which often turn out to be thought experiments rather than actually existing in wood or brass. The Latin word used, of course, was theorica, meaning something between a theory and a model. And actually the word model in modern English is suitably ambiguous uh, between the theoretical and the tangible. Uh, and, of course, that word theorica was precisely the one co-opted by Chaucer. So you could even say that an instrument treatise was his original plan, although I'm not going to go that far. But the astrolabe contains the first appearance of the word theorica in English, uh, and the equatory, this manuscript, contains the second. But Price had more evidence to show you, uh, and it was this. The word Chaucer, identifying the number of days in 1392 Julian years. Price compared... Uh, that word uh, with the same word in a memorandum from the Wool Key in London in an attempt to show this was a holograph manuscript in Chaucer's hand. Now, as you might well know, his arguments convinced some people, but by no means everyone, and the debate went back and forth for decades. Some people objected that Chaucer didn't have the astronomical in, uh, expertise to write this treatise, which I don't think is true. Uh, other people pointed out Price's comparison of the hand was flawed, which was true. Anyway, to cut a long story short, just last year, the hand was positively identified as this one here, uh, by a lady sitting at the back of the room. Uh, and <laughs> this hand, which is in a manuscript uh, containing two instrument treatises by that man, Richard of Wallingford, this hand comes with a name, Johannes de Westwick, John Westwick, a monk of St Albans and later of Tynemouth. So it's not Chaucer in a secular setting, it's a monk. So, why this long introduction into 60 years of disproved historiography? I'm not just trying to make excuses for showing up to a Chaucer conference. There are two broader points to be made. Firstly, there's the historiographical point about our tendency to try to attribute works to names we already know. There must surely have been a great many writers, students, theorists and practitioners who remain and will probably always be anonymous. And secondly, there are the striking parallels between Chaucer's prologue and the Equatory Manuscript. I'm not about to suggest that John Westwick set out to complete Chaucer's project, 
But I do find it striking that someone we've never heard of before could produce something so similar to what Chaucer planned so soon after the astrolabe was written. But what about the holograph question, I hear you ask? Couldn't Chaucer have written it and this master John Westwick copied it? Well, I don't think he could, but it's an important question because if I want to hold up the equitry as an example of didactic writing, I need to have an idea about the author and his audience. So let's look at that holograph question. When I say it's a holograph, I mean it's in the hand of the person who composed it. I don't mean it has to be an entirely original composition. As we've just heard, there's not much that was wholly original. Um, I mean it's original in this form. It's not copied wholesale. So, what's the evidence? The treatise is in a single hand, it's free of copying errors, and the spelling is quite consistent. There are many corrections, additions, and glosses in the same hand, as you can see all over this, this slide. In fact, the digitization of this manuscript allows us quite a close look. So you can see he's changed technical details, like this 68. Erasures like this were Westwick's preferred way of making corrections, so it's not always immediately obvious quite how many changes he's made. Some of the additions are in Latin, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily all translated from some other source. It could be a partial translation, or it could be translated from the author's own Latin composition, or it could be an original composition in English influenced by Latin concepts. Anyway, as we've just been hearing, translation doesn't preclude originality. Another mark of a holograph, it's sometimes said, are accurate illustrations. The idea there is that copyists don't always do a very good job. That's a bit simplistic, I suppose. Copyist illustrations can often be very accurate, as we know from manuscripts of the treatise on the astrolabe. But it is true that the illustrations in the equitry are quite good. This is the face of the equatorium, and you might be able to see that the planet's lines of apsides have been marked along with their equant and deferent centres, uh, and that's been done quite well. And just for comparison, this is our, our man John Westwick's attempt at a diagram in his copy of Richard of Wallingford's Albion Treatise. I don't have time to go into the details, but it's not that well executed. What it is, is a superficially decent copy of an image. What it's not is a faithful rendering of that part of the instrument as it's described in the treatise. That would have required the copyist to study the text very closely before drawing the image. I think he's just copied an image. He's done it quite well, but it's not uh, an accurate rendering of what's in the treatise. Okay, so you say, if the equitry diagram is that good, why does Westwick say, I what well it is figured boisterously? I know it's roughly drawn. Didn't he know how good he was? Well, I think this is self-deprecation, like perhaps when Chaucer calls himself a lewd compilator and excuses his lighter English. Remember, Westwick cited Chaucer as a source of numerical data. It's quite possible he got this literary conceit from Chaucer too. I'm not denying that uh, Chaucer was obviously aware of his own limitations, but I think there's an element of literary conceit in what Chaucer wrote uh, as well. More to the point, this I what well is a statement of authorship. A copyist would hardly insert that. And it's not the only statement of authorship. He's at pains to situate his writing in time and place, as we see here. Mine equitry, 1392 complete, at London. Another statement of authorship might be the choice to write in English. As we've seen, some of the manuscript, especially the tables, is in Latin. So its writer clearly had a choice and chose to situate himself linguistically as well as geographically and temporally. I'm not going to discuss why he did this, partly because I've already given a presentation on that question not very long ago. If you're interested in that, you can find it on YouTube uh, and there's a link. And of course, if you have any feedback, I'd be very glad to receive it. End of plug. But today, I don't want to ask why English was used. I want to ask how. The key questions are, firstly... How did the subject matter and the author's aims influence the style of the treatise? And secondly, the way vernacular vocabulary was used and sometimes moulded to suit the purposes of the author. So let's start with his aims. What were they? On the face of it, the treatise comprises instructions on how to make and use a planetary equatorium, a device to compute the positions of the planets. This is a very practical treatise. As I mentioned, some of these treatises only appear to be about a physical instrument. This one's the real thing, and it does a great job. Unlike many medieval instructions, or in fact modern instructions, this one can easily be followed today. 
Uh, the model on the left here is, and I apologise for myself, I'm there for scale purposes only, uh, is a full-scale replica made for Derek Price in the 1950s, and the one at the bottom is the fully functioning virtual model on the Cambridge Digital Library website, and the other one I made myself in my back garden just to see if I could, and it's in that suitcase over there, so if you uh, want to take a closer look, um, you can do that later on. So... Was this treatise written as instructions for a craftsman, maybe one who could have had it read aloud to him? Possibly, but like with the astrolabe, we should be careful before assuming there was only one purpose or one reader. We see this in the very first lines. They're not purely instructive, they're didactic. The author doesn't just want the reader to understand that the equatorium should be 72 inches in diameter, he wants him to understand why. The larger it is... The wider the divisions of the circle, the wider the divisions, the smaller fractions of degrees you can fit in. Even where this treatise is at its most practical, the author's teaching. Here's just one example. These two red circles, here and here, have to be precisely the same size. If they're not, he says, thine epicycle is false. But, if thou misshape in this case, I shall teach thee a remedy. And he then explains how you can knock this little bit of the epicycle in or out so it fits. But what I find more striking than this word teach are all the eyes and thighs. This is a 14-page treatise, and it has 48 eyes and 13 months. And how many thighs or thines? 158. That's more than any other word except and, in, of, and the. And it's not just for physical objects like thy compass. What's the caption I cut off here? It's, thus lieth thine instrument when thou makest equation of thy moon. There's a real sense of personal relationship here, I think. A real coaching tone that I've not found in other instrument treatises. Now, I know what you're thinking. What does all this mean? What is this centre arrow? Don't worry. John Westwick has you covered there. By the time we get to this point in the treatise, he's already defined it for us. The midpoint of this plate where the fixed foot of your compass stands, will I call a centre are? And it's that bit there. Sorry for my pronunciation, by the way. And the common centre deferent, that bit we've just been knocking about. This little hole that is no greater than a small needle shall be clepped the common centre deferent of planetis. Uh, this part here. He defines nine terms in this way. I don't have time to discuss them all in detail, but as you can see, they vary. Some, uh, most are compounds of existing words, some of which, like common centre deferent, are fairly straightforward descriptions of technical innovations in his instrument. Some are word-for-word -word translations of the terminology found in many Latin treatises. There's that obviously Arabic-influenced line al hudda and then there's this rather evocative midnight line. Does that sound familiar? Here's what he says about it. The line that goes from centre Aaron, we know where that is, to the head of Capricorn, which is here, so it's this line. Uh, I say a divider this midnight line in nine parties equals. Now, let's leave aside the wonderful orality of that I say, yeah, he say, yeah, which matches the vocal way he defines using the verbs callen and clippen. Just look at the way he cites the treatise on the astrolabe. Of course, there were other treatises on astrolabes, but none that we know of in Middle English. And remember, he's already cited Chaucer. And indeed, Chaucer's treatise does use the phrase midnight line for the, uh, for the equivalent part of the astrolabe. So John Westwick had, I think, read Chaucer's astrolabe. And more than that, I'd say he expected his reader to be familiar with it too. Well, why do I say that? The list of words he defines is not very long, as you can see, but there's a much longer list of words he doesn't define and whose only previous attestation in English is in the treatise on the astrolabe. Words like Capricorn, compass, epicycle, and fractions. Usually, Westwick uses these without any explanation. Sometimes, though, he needs to do a little bit more. Here's one example. At this point in the treatise, he had already used the word rule in two senses, a general principle and a straight edge for drawing lines. Neither of those uses was new. But the word label, in the sense of a metal pointer, doesn't appear anywhere before the equatory, except in the treatise on the astrolabe. 
So here we can see Westwick exploiting his reader's greater familiarity with the word rule to help redefine the word label. As you can see, there's a subtle interweaving of the two words. After this, he doesn't use rule for that part of the instrument anymore, just label, as you can see in this diagram there. Something else you'll notice in this diagram. I just said that common centre deferent was a description of a technical innovation in Westwick's instrument. And it is. His idea of incorporating a single scaled deferent radius for all the planets into this common epicycle is unique to this treatise. And yet in this diagram he gives the name in Latin, Centrum Deferentis Commune. That could be evidence for this manuscript being some kind of translation, though we're still no wiser about the original source or translation process involved, but it does remind us of how fluid language choice was in this period. Now, of course, given how few astronomical treatises there are in the vernacular at this date, it's not surprising to find some brand new words. Here's the list of brand new words. I'll be interested in your opinion, but this strikes me as a relatively short list. It didn't need to be any longer, because Westwick mainly used words that were well known, or had already been defined by Chaucer. Now, I expect some of you are thinking, if that's a list of English words, some of them don't look very English. Aren't orcs and motus just loan words? Or well, maybe they are, although historians of astronomy like me still like to use them. But, if all of these words are really appearing in English for the first time, it's only their subsequent acceptance into the language that makes them English. It's continued usage that distinguishes words like eccentric and equidistant from orcs and motus. Whether or not these words caught on, Westwick obviously expected his reader to understand them. Still, maybe the distinction between the motus here and uh, the clarifying a capite arietis, which we'd say is a separate thing, a Latin gloss, is an arbitrary distinction. After all, technical texts in this period always seem to include at least some words in Latin. I guess the larger point is the capacity of the vernacular was aligned to its uses. If Westwick coined new words, that's because there was a need for them. English was well suited to the practical personal treatise he was trying to write, but as you can see, his blend of theoretical and practical genres forced him to use new words, whether that involved borrowing them from Latin or Arabic, or redefining them, as in the case of mean, uh, which he used here for the first time in a strict mathematical sense, as opposed to just meaning intermediate. Whether Westwick was translating or composing from scratch, or both at the same time, it's a very pragmatic use of language. But of course his main focus wasn't teaching language, he was teaching the equatoria, and we see that focus at every stage. When he's done with its construction, he moves on to its use. And that's just as much of a learning opportunity. If this instrument were just a tool for computing planetary longitudes, he wouldn't pause his instructions at this point, as he does, in order to note that if you move the black thread, which you might just be able to see, across the pole of the epicycle there, it will show you the true orcs, the true argument of anomaly. That's a completely superfluous step in the process of finding Mars's longitude, but it's part of the Ptolemaic theory. Clearly, he wants his reader to learn some of that theory along the way. And just as when we made the equatorium, he doesn't only want us to know what to do, but why to do it. So here's the instruction to do what you see here. Put the common centre deferent of the epicycle on the deferent centre on the plate for the planet you're trying to locate, and then fix it in place with a needle. With a needle, there we are. That's very clear but apparently not clear enough, because two pages later he repeats the instruction. Your needle must not be removed when it is stuck through the common centre deferent into any centre deferent on the plate until you finish the job of finding where the planet is. And here's why. If your common centre deferent stirs from the centre on the plate, the whole process of finding the planet is lost. And to emphasise how important this is, he adds a little pointing hand. <laughs> So, to conclude, I've drawn your attention to the ways that Middle English is used in this manuscript for didactic purposes. This pedagogical style makes the treatise accessible to a craftsman and lay reader, as well, perhaps, as a student of astronomical science. Just like with the astrolabe, we shouldn't assume there was only one intended reader. The potential audiences for the vernacular were diverse, and of course that included women. 
There were lots of un there, there are lots of, of unanswered questions here, not least the relationship between the practical instructions and rather less practical mean motion tables to nine sexagesimal places. But I'm inclined to believe John Westwick did have a single reader in mind and clear pedagogical aims for him or perhaps her. It's not surprising all this pedagogy has made scholars think of Chaucer. But even if we weren't able to name John Westwick, it'd be silly to suppose Chaucer was the only person in England who was able and inclined to write didactic prose. Highlighting this treatise allows us to correct the persistent myth that science or pedagogy pro progressed through the achievements of a few great men. On the other hand, it's also fascinating to see the influence of Chaucer on a monk who had clearly read the treatise on the astrolabe and was writing very soon afterwards. I'm hoping that more attention to this and other similar manuscripts with varying levels of innovation and scientific competence will help us get a clearer picture of what was surely a vibrant astronomical community at the end of the 14th century. Thank you very much.